Nicole Hemmer, professor of history at Vanderbilt University, author of Partisans, the conservative revolutionaries who remade American politics in the 1990s. Uh, Nicole, welcome. I'm here with Emma Viglin. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so uh, the overview of, of your book, it is uh, basically talking about that time, moving from the Reagan era into, I guess, what is the beginning of, of this era that we're in now in terms of Republican and conservative thought. Let's just go back and uh, talk about what characterized the Reagan era for us and, 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 and make a distinction, if you will, if there is one, which I think there is to some extent, between sort of the ideological uh, and the sort of, um, I, I guess you would call it the, uh, I, I don't know, just dispositional, maybe, uh, of, of, of the party at that time. Well, the, the big difference is that the Reagan era was one in which you had a president and a party that believed that you could build massive majorities using conservatism. So they believed that conservatism had to be popular, it had to be optimistic in order to build these big majorities. And of course, Reagan still used um, negative campaigning. He still leaned into racial stereotypes. Um, but he he tried to keep that kind of optimistic, pragmatic conservatism at the forefront because he wanted to win in those big landslide elections, which is exactly what he does in 80 and 84. It's what George H.W. Bush does in 88. Um, and that is replaced in the 1990s with a group of political activists who want to use conservatism to divide, to polarize the electorate. And so there is something quite distinct about the party of, say, Ronald Reagan and the party of Newt Gingrich. Is is that also like, could you draw a line and say a party that was attempting to win over the majority, as you say, to like a party that behaves with the urgency of a minoritarian party, which is what we see now? Absolutely. And you can see that in the different ways that they use power, right? That that Ronald Reagan was seeking out kind of the sweet spot where he could still push through conservative policies, but where he would float an idea. And if it was really unpopular, he would back away from it. Um, this happened with attempts to roll back the Voting Rights Act, for instance. Um, whereas by the time you get to Newt Gingrich, what is he doing? He's innovating in all of these different kinds of uh, congressional obstruction, the longest government shutdown in history at that point, all sorts of investigations, often led by conspiracy theories, the impeachment of Bill Clinton, all of these were kind of novelties for using Congress to obstruct rather than to govern. Um, well, let's, uh, what was it that was happening during the Reagan era that led to uh, the Gingrich um, era, if you will? I mean, because I, I mean, I remember, uh, I remember Morning in America, uh, with, with Reagan, where it was all like his whole, you know, I just have images of like, of like the sun shining at that time and it, and it caused a realignment. I mean, that's what I was told by my professors at the time. We were in an era of realignment. Uh, things have, have, have changed in that respect. Um, and, and again, like, you know, from the policy standpoint, he, he would back off stuff. He, he raised taxes in terms of, uh, uh of, uh, uh, social security taxes, he gave what people will call amnesty now to four or five million um, uh, immigrants. Um, I mean, and those are just off the off. You know, uh, those are the, the sort of the, the highlight ones. But what was what was going on underneath? And certainly it was exacerbated by George Herbert Walker Bush, who was really not of the same ilk as Reagan ideologically, it feels like. Oh, that's exactly right. So one of the big things that was shaping the politics of the 80s that changes in the 90s is that the Cold War ends. I mean, Ronald Reagan, you mentioned immigration. He truly believed in the free movement of goods and people as part of what democracy was, how the U.S. distinguished itself from the closed systems of communism. So that was something that he leaned into based on the geopolitics of the, of the time. And the Cold War comes to an end, and suddenly that need to appeal to democracy, that need to appeal to freedom is different. Um, but you're also in a different media environment. The rise of cable news and talk radio is happening in the 1990s that rewards outrage and um, over-the-top kind of uh, political rhetoric and approaches. So that's changing at the time. There really is a sense that um, the things that were holding that Reagan majority together are coming apart in some ways. And what's happening with Bush is particularly interesting because you mentioned all the ways that Reagan was 
uh, kind of pragmatic, pragmatic or not necessarily, didn't necessarily keep to the conservative line. He's criticized by a lot of conservatives for that, but at the same time, he's Reagan. So the criticisms don't necessarily stick. When they make those same complaints about George H.W. Bush, they stick because they don't see him as a conservative true believer. So all of that is helping melt the, conser- the Reagan uh, consensus into something else. Reagan was, at the time, people were talking about how he was Teflon and uh, th- nothing would stick to him. But everything seemed to stick to George uh, Her- Herbert Walker Bush. And he w- they, they were pissed about Souter. They were pissed mm-hmm. about him making a big deal about no new taxes. Read my lips and here are the new taxes. Um, to the extent that, and then, it, I mean, I remember the 92 uh, convention. Um, and, and I can't remember the sequencing. When, when, and we, we, this is, I guess, the way to talk about Pat Buchanan, but Pat Buchanan represented something that was happening sort of underground between Reagan and, you know, through Reagan, but it really began to blossom during H.W. Uh, uh, Bush. I remember Dan Quayle had to come out because of, 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 uh, of, of Buchanan and attack Murphy Brown. <laughs> which was a TV show because she wanted to have a child uh, on her own. And this was the culture war. This is like, was this the first time that the culture war was articulated as being a culture war w- w- with Buchanan? Yes. Yeah, so there had clearly been culture wars in America and its history before, but Buchanan really gave it a sharpness and a way of talking about it as a war, as he put it, a war for the soul of America. That's the line that he uses in that very famous 1992 convention speech. And, you know, he had been eyeing running for president in 1988, but at the time, like the Reagan legacy was too strong. By 1992, after four years of Bush, he seizes the moment. And there is this sense, as you mentioned with Dan Quayle, as you would see in the 1992 Republican convention with a call for structures on the border, which was picking up Pat Buchanan's anti-immigrant line from his his, uh, primary campaign, that there was a kind of capitulation of the party to these elements that were more radical. It's it's George H.W. Bush inviting Rush Limbaugh to the White House in 92 to win his support. There's this sense that these aren't voices that you can ignore, that you have to bring them in. And in some ways, you have to follow their lead. Um, was this, I mean, is Buchanan just simply the, um, the heir to sort of like Goldwater and the the so-called paranoid uh, style of American politics that, you know, to the extent that that is, exists on the right. I mean, is he just the heir to that? And it it it's almost like midwifed on some level through Reagan, and then this sort of like frustration where where Bush is is sort of tacking back away from that. The frustration grows. Well, he's certainly the heir to an earlier version of conservatism. You might go back to like the 1930s, 1940s. Um, He uses America First as one of his campaign slogans in a very deliberate call to the isolationist America First Committee of 1939, 1940. So he's calling on that old right before the Cold War. So that's an important part. But he's also calling on another strain in American politics that's less Barry Goldwater than it is George Wallace, that's trying to pick up on that that white resentment and frustration and discontent that starts to mobilize around things like school desegregation and the Equal Rights Amendment and gay rights in the 1970s. And Buchanan zeroes in on that anger and outrage and puts it into um, this older conservative ideological framework of isolationism, protectionism. um, And that's sort of his model for governing. And, and we should say this is not to say that Reagan wasn't sort of nurturing that as well by Neshoba County, you know, opening his. Absolutely. Um, but it, it was he, Buchanan's heart was really in it. Yeah. Buchanan's and, heart uh, was really in it. Yes. Um, and, and the difference between Buchanan and Reagan is Reagan goes to Neshoba County. He talks about states' rights. Pat Buchanan goes to Stone Mountain, Georgia, and talks about his Confederate ancestors and the glory of the Confederate South. And that's a that's a difference of a kind. Yeah. Um, and and I think people forget that that uh, Bush invited Limbaugh. Now Limbaugh at this point is also an important character in your story. Uh, he starts in 1988, largely helped 
by the uh, the reversal, I guess, the removal of the fairness doctrine under under Ronald Reagan, because suddenly talk radio can then have what they call format purity and he can build off this. They can local uh, stations can have their local versions, their mini uh, limbaughs after a while. And, the, and, and, and he gets really big really quickly. And um, I, I mean, people forget that he was that important in the early 90s. He was he was a phenomenon, unlike anything anyone had ever seen before. You know, he started on radio, as you mentioned, as a, a national host in 88, helped in part by uh, regulatory changes, but also by technological changes that make it possible to have this, this live simulcast show across the nation where people can call in. And so it gives it that interactive kind of populist feel. 91, 92, he's got best-selling books. He's starting his own uh, television show that was produced by Roger Ailes in 1992. This kind of multimedia, conservative, entertainment show had never been seen like this before. And it just wasn't clear how much power he was actually going to have. But Bush, in inviting him to the White House, gives him an incredible amount of power within the Republican Party and the conservative movement. And Bush has got to do that because he's he's worried about his right flank at that point, and he's trying to get his bona fides. All right, so let's move into sort of uh, the Gingrich, um, uh, the ascent of G Gingrich. I mean, I remember that people were talking about impeaching Bill Clinton the day before he took office, like literally that time. And I think people also forget this. He did not win with the majority of votes. He had a plurality of the votes, but he didn't win with a majority. And I feel like the, uh, the that element, the sense that, you know, the, the, the Republicans lost because, and I don't know if it's true or not. I don't know. I haven't seen anything that I, I consider definitive as to, you know, who Ross Perot took votes from more uh, in, in that election. But there was an, a tremendous anger towards Bill Clinton, in part because... You know, he was he represented the hippies because he didn't fight in Vietnam and his wife was 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 saying, I'm not going to stay in the kitchen and bake cakes and um, Hillary Clinton. And um, and he hadn't won with a majority. And so they were talking about impeaching him on day one. That's right. And it takes a while for that to really take hold in Congress. But even before Bill Clinton's reelection in 1996, you have members of Congress like Bob Barr, who are starting to float this idea of impeachment, particularly if Bill Clinton is reelected. And in the meantime, they're helping to develop and feed all of these conspiracy theories about the Clintons and the ways that they have illegitimately seized power over the course of decades. Um, and that could be from accusations that he was leading a drug ring out of the governor's mansion in Arkansas. Um, it could be that they had, as the Clinton body count conspiracy suggested, just a huge number of people that they killed on their path to power. But that idea of illegitimacy was fed even before Congress took up impeachment. The interesting thing about Gingrich is that he was was pretty slow to act on impeachment because he felt that he could work with what was a, a pretty, if not conservative, then the moderate Clinton presidency. But there was a right flank in uh, the Republican caucus, people who called themselves the true believers who kept pushing for impeachment and kept pushing. Um, and ultimately, that's where uh, Gingrich ended up. Where did that where did that come from? Like, where did that right flank essentially like develop was this a are, are we like even as late as 1992 three are we seeing sort of the that ripple effect from the civil rights act i mean because it, it feels like that like, you know uh johnson said we've lost them for two generations the south i mean it turns out a little bit longer than that but um but was that like the the sort of like the the shock wave still coming where you know people on the ground uh were starting to realize like hey wait a second the the democrats are not the democrats that i grew up with the, you know rob bird what's he doing like what how come he's not wearing a hood anymore i mean that type of thing 
Oh, it's definitely a part of it. It's a backlash not only to the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, but to immigration reform in 1965. It's still a backlash to the Great Society and the growth of affirmative action. It's in the 1990s when you start to see some of the results of those policies. You see uh, in the 1980s, Jesse Jackson running for president. You see um, a woman on the presidential ticket for the first time in the 1980s. You see Anita Hill coming forward with accusations of sexual harassment and being taken seriously in 1991 in the, the confirmation hearings for Clarence Thomas. And so there is this sense that the country is changing in fundamental ways. You're starting to see the decline of a white majority during the Reagan era of like, 86%, and that is going to be declining over the course of the 1990s. And so all of those forces are being weaponized by political actors. They're being pushed into, and you have people like Buchanan who are pointing to, say, immigrants and saying, oh, those are the people who are responsible for the problems in your lives. They're responsible for crime. They're responsible for the economy. They're responsible for the fact that you don't feel as good about your place in society as you used to. And that was a very powerful message. Um, and it's something that with the help of conservative media, um, with the help of conservatives who were disgruntled because they felt Ronald Reagan and Bush didn't go far enough, um, that you have the right leaning even further right in order to both operate well in this media environment, um, but also to attract those most vocal and active parts of their base um, who are particularly um, fearful or resentful or opposed to um, the changes happening in the United States. How much of that shift just was one to accommodate this kind of new angry white men uh, backlash, but also because they were in the minority, it's almost like they came, or, or because they had a, a Democratic president, it's almost like they came up with this strategy or fell into it, and now they have not really looked back in terms of the rhetoric being more extreme and that also ch changing the complexion of the party and the priorities of the party. Well, there, there absolutely is an effort, especially in 1994, to win over the angry white male. It's in this moment that that phrase, angry white male, becomes ubiquitous in American politics. And it's not just Republicans who are, who are going after that vote. It's, it's Democrats as well. But as Democrats are moving to the right on things like immigration and on crime policy, Republicans are moving even further to the right to differentiate themselves and pick up that angry white male vote. And so you see... Um, <coughs> people who are running for Congress as Republicans in 1994, reaching out to militia members, um, trying to attract those groups that are especially active in politics in the 1990s. Um, and part of it is that they are deliberately trying to attract the angry white male. And part of it is that once they have attracted a further right fringe, they find themselves like constantly being pulled to the right and they they lose control of their party as it begins to move further and further to the right. I, I get the dynamic where the further the Democrats move to the right, the more the Republicans move to the right to differentiate themselves. Which came first, though? Like, I mean, it, which came first? Or was it just sort of like so slow that it was hard to sort of like measure until it hits some type of like, I don't know, uh, you know, terminal velocity. It, it can be difficult to disaggregate because there are so many things that are happening in the U.S. in 1993 and 1994 that it's it's hard to pull apart because you have this this odd dynamic where in like 93 and early 94 you also have both the Democrats and Republicans trying to win over the Perot vote and the Perot vote, which is angry and anti-establishment, but is also heterodox. And, you know, Perot was in favor of abortion. He was in favor of gun regulation. Um, so it doesn't necessarily suggest that it was inevitable that everybody was going to be moving to the right. You could have moved in more of this, this heterodox Perot direction. That's not where the parties go. Um, but I think that it is in particular, 
the vocalness of these right-wing activists. Um, for instance, the, the local right-wing activists in California who pushed for Proposition 187 um, and use very racist language about immigrants from Mexico in order to push that, that proposition forward, they're moving to the right on immigration and it's the Democratic Party that's following them. So sometimes it differs by issue and sometimes it's not playing out exactly that way, right? You know, the Democrats are supportive of gun regulation, the Republican Party party um, moves hard against gun regulation in 93 and 94. So on some issues, they're moving apart. But on some, the Democratic Party is kind of following the Republicans. And, and we should say Perot was his big issue was NAFTA uh, and mm -hmm. uh, that it was going to, I mean, his, he famously said, you know, you're going to hear a giant sucking sound and that's going to be the jobs that get poured out of, of the country and taking this sort of very... Um, uh, I mean, in many respects, I thought he was he was he was a loon and he kept jumping in and out of the race literally right. over the course of of the summer. Uh, but he was largely right in at least like sensing a the potential for uh, NAFTA to harm the American worker and B that this was going to be an issue uh, that this outsourcing issue was going to be relevant. And it has obviously been for the past 30 years. Um, it, and, and, and it seemed like neither party adopted that mantle at all, uh, until, you know, to the extent that either party has in any real way, or at least paid lip service to it until like 20 years later, 25 years later. That's exactly right. I mean, both Buchanan and Perot saw in NAFTA something where there was an elite bipartisan consensus, right? NAFTA was drafted by Republicans. It was signed into law by Bill Clinton. And people were really frustrated with it. Some people really liked it. But there was a, a faction of Americans who were strongly against NAFTA and did not see representation for their view in either major party. And as you mentioned, that would continue for for quite some time. And it's part of the reason why people like Pat Buchanan remain relevant over the course of the 90s and into the 2000s, because in those places where you have this elite bipartisan consensus and nobody is really challenging it, um, it, it opens up a door for somebody like Buchanan to become the voice of this dissatisfied, underrepresented group of people. And, and, not, and I want to, obviously, Don, I want to skip this whole uh, era during the Bush years, but I mean, there, there are two things that, that, that just stick out for me is that, you know, Clinton had promised after NAFTA was going to be followed up with um, uh, worker and environmental protections in Mexico, you know, as a subsequent add on that never materialized. And the other thing is I jumped through the, the, that, you know, that it makes me really uh, it reminds me of Barack Obama pushing um, the TPP. Mm -hmm. In 2016, mm -hmm. like literally pushing this NAFTA style, in many respects, more massive, uh, almost like, you know, like NAFTA, but, you know, grown up and uh, 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 more monstrous in many respects. Um, during the summer, during that election, it, like literally pushing it up until, you know, it became completely untenable. And um, that was a huge boon to uh, Donald Trump in states like Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, which just so happened to be the three states that gave him the election by 70,000 votes. And that was another moment where you could see that lack of representation having a real effect because the writing was on the wall. I mean, I, I do think that Barack Obama very much believed in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but you had seen uh, Bernie Sanders surge, uh, had, you know, surge into a competitive position during the 2016 primaries. You see Hillary Clinton begin to shift her position on TPP over the course of the 2016 election. So it's, it's clear that things are shifting, um, but I think for Barack Obama, he really believed that this was going to be part of his legacy and that he was doing the right thing. Uh, but the consensus behind that position, to the extent it ever existed, was very quickly crumbling under his feet. But I mean, it, as a simply as a political matter, I mean, I I personally think that TPP is is, is highly problematic. But uh, and I and I believe he was sincere in his belief. You know that that's what we should do. I think he was sincere in a lot of beliefs that I think were ultimately shown to be wrong based upon who was advising him. Uh, 
and, and we should say the chief negotiator for that was the same Citibank executive who gave him a list of potential cabinet make uh, um, uh, people in, in the summer of or fall of 2008 uh, that Robert Rubin had probably helped him uh, write. And they, they all landed in that administration. Uh, they're also the ones who designed the, the response to the financial crisis, et cetera, et cetera. But as, as a pure political matter, the tone deafness to that issue uh, is is striking, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. And Donald Trump, the least sort of like populist human being outside of affectation in, you know, that we could have, uh, you know, a billionaire, supposedly, um, is able to pick that up and at the very least, you know, pretend to be a man of the people. Well, Perot also, also kind of using those same trappings, right? That's Given, true. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Perot was a billionaire tech executive um, who ran for president without any sort of political experience. So it really is a model there. And I think you're you're exactly right that the politics were all wrong in that moment. Um, and I think that it reveals something both about the administration's belief that Trump couldn't win, um, that he wasn't somebody to worry about, um, but also a kind of ideological belief that Obama had that the president could be above politics and would be rewarded for that. And I don't think that that was borne out during his presidency. No. Mm. Um, all right. So let's go back to, uh, so uh, Clinton happens. This, uh, you know, like, it, it's almost like taking, I don't know, some mold and putting it in like a damp area as it grows in terms of Gingrich. And this, this becomes um, uh, like a, uh, you know, a, a, just a massive machine. Uh, Bush wins. I mean, not the popular vote, uh, but the popular one on the Republican uh, Supreme Court. And um, and and so what what happens during the Bush years? Because Bush comes back and he tries to do sort of more like Reagan compassionate conservatism. He called it. That's a that's exactly right. And you, if you look back at the um, publications at the time of his victory, you see newspapers calling him George W. Reagan, um, saying that he was the son of George H.W. Bush, but he was the heir to Reagan, that he had picked up that mantle. Um, even though, again, like he, he wasn't building consensus through conservatism, but he was open to immigration reform. He was focused at times on education. And even with his foreign policy after 9-11, this idea that he was forged in the fires of this ideological conflict and that he would lead the nation forward with toughness through it. So that kind of Reagan-esque, all of those uh, sort of mythologies about Reagan begin to adhere to him along with the massive tax cuts that he passes through in his first year. Um, and what do you see by the end of the Bush administration? You see the global financial collapse. Um, you see the cost of deregulation and those massive tax cuts. Um, you see Hurricane Katrina and the idea that I'm from the government and I'm here to help is actually kind of a good thing and not the scariest words in the English language. Um, you see Iraq and Afghanistan um, devolving into the decades-long debacles that they were. And so this idea that he was trying out Reaganism again um, and that it ended in such clear bipartisan failure um, was in, in many ways kind of the death knell of Reaganism and really does open the floodgates for this other kind of conservatism that somebody like Pat Buchanan had championed in the early 1990s. It's funny. There's there's two things that strike. Like I would love to know the last time Grover Norquist called for Ronald Reagan to be on a, on the head of a dime. I think it was he would. They were pushing this. People don't. I mean, during those aughts, you still had mm -hmm. let's put Reagan on Mount Rushmore, and now nobody talks about Reagan at all. Um, but I do. There were there were two things that strike me that that Bush came in with a more Buchanan like policy or at least a stance no no uh, uh nation building mm -hmm. um and then that changed on 9 11 and 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 i think you know cheney certainly had a different um ideas uh going into that but i was at the 2004 uh convention as uh, on radio row and some guy saddled up next to me didn't know you know anything about Air America, who I was with at the time, just assumed we were right wingers because why else would we be on radio? And he came up to me and he goes like, this crew of Bush people, they're all Jews. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, I'm a, I'm a Buchanan type of person. <laughs> I was like, came up I, to you and said, yeah, that? And I, said, <laughs> I got news for you. I'm a Jew type of person, but I was really struck on how at that time. And I remember, you know, CPAC at that time where people like George Bush mm -hmm. is not conservative enough. And they were mad about Harriet Myers. They were really worried that, 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 that Bush was going to put a suitor on there. They were going to sort of play the game with abortion and never deliver. Mm. And that seemed to sort of like rekindle. I just remember little, like, you know, little, like college students at CPAC just, you know, getting really angry about George Bush. And that anger was coming from somewhere. Uh, and it was, it seems to me that it was like, all the Gen Xers who grew up under Reagan and saw like a specific element of Reagan gave that to their kids on the right. And it, and it, it created these sort of like Alex P Keaton monsters essentially. Very much so. And I think that you're right that, that, that discontent was there. It was, remember the sort of anti Muslim movement that was so rampant on the right during the Bush years, even as George W. Bush was calling for more compassion, um, calling for people to be good to their Muslim neighbors, um, setting that aside from the actual policies that he had. Um, there was this very intense anti-Muslim movement. Uh, you talked about CPAC. There was a lot of debate over whether Pamela Geller would be allowed there or not, um, and some divisions that were happening there. Um, you see Bush push for immigration reform, and his administration had not realize the level of antipathy toward that, the level of anger over the idea that you would have immigration reform and a path to citizenship. So the Bush administration doesn't really see this right-wing backlash coming, but it is there throughout his presidency. And you see, for instance, in 2008, um, when Ron Paul runs for president, Richard Spencer and a bunch of these paleo libertarians and people who will be leaders um, it, it, for a brief while in, in what would call itself the alt-right, they're all ready to seize that moment of the post-Bush moment and um, the unpopularity of the Republican establishment and put forward what they see as a different, truer type of conservatism that can be more open and honest about things like Jewish people and black people. And they are ready to lean into that moment. And you write about uh, not just Limbaugh, but you write about like uh, Ann Coulter and Dinesh D'Souza, who actually uh, dated in college, I think, at Dartmouth. Uh, Laura Ingram, who I think also came, came from I mean, Dartmouth, was was really turning them out at that time. But when you talk about that immigration, uh, the immigration reform that Bush was trying to push, because he and Karl Rove really understood that um, uh, the, the Republican Party needed uh, and, and felt that they could um, they could connect with uh, at least a certain amount of of uh latinos it was like guys like it was like ingram and mark levin and sort of uh, all of that crew that really killed immigration reform and there was it, it, it was amazing to me that that the bush administration did not realize or was not doing well, what happened with that cleave? How did they not see that coming when his dad had to, you know, feet, uh, you know, uh, Limbaugh 10 years earlier? How did they not see that coming? I think in part, they just weren't tapped in to uh, the Republican base. They didn't take seriously conservative media. And Bush had had that moment of such intense high popularity. And then he had won re-election. He finally won his majority. And there was this sense that the right was just going to be on his side. And they weren't paying attention to alternative media. They weren't reading blogs, which in the Bush era was where a lot of this discontent was being made visible. They weren't really listening. They were, they were talking to conservative talk radio hosts, um, but they were mostly talking to people like Limbaugh. And it's not until they start to lose uh, Laura Ingram and Sean Hannity, that they invite them to the White House and try to win them back. Um, but they're just not paying close enough attention because I think they took for granted that Bush would have this continued support. Um, and it really is only in like 2005 with the Harriet Myers scandal, 2006 when the Republicans lose uh, the the um, both houses of Congress that you really see that that backlash start to crystallize and become even more visible because Bush has lost so much power and isn't able to run for election again. So there's no need to support him anymore. Um, but, but I think by and large, everything that I've seen is that they they weren't keeping tabs on the base of their party.
What was happening with the Democrats in, in your estimation? There's no analog uh, for the Democrats to, to, to what talk radio means to the Republicans. Is there? I mean, I, 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 I've never been there, able to sort yeah. of see one. There isn't. And I think it's because the parties um, were developmentally different, especially by like the 1980s and 1990s. The Republican Party was becoming a party held together by ideology. And the Republican Party was still a pretty, the Democratic Party was still a pretty diverse coalition of interest. And it is harder to message to a coalition of interest with fiery, outrageous, um, hot kind of media. And I think that that was a, a real challenge, that, that the kind of the needs of the party and the needs of a profitable um, political entertainment complex, just they weren't the same. It's much easier when you know for certain that 85% of your audience is a white guy, hmm. uh, you know, between, between certain ages to, uh, I guess, program to that. Yeah, absolutely. It is. It's much more difficult with a diverse audience. And especially if you look at the Democratic Party, um, it is less ideologically diverse than it used to be, but it still contains lots of conservative and moderate voters um, who might share some of the ideological commitments or policy preferences of the Republican Party, but don't join the Republican Party because the Republican Party embraces racist policies or doesn't seem to have any interest in reaching out to say black voters. Um, so the, the democratic coalition has always been much more diverse, not just in terms of race and ethnicity and gender, but also in terms of just ideological commitments and policy preferences. And that's much harder to message to. So, um, I know this is sort of outside your portfolio, uh, as a historian, uh, but, and I, I know that, but they, everyone's got to ask you this question. Um, if there is a trajectory or a descent, I guess, depending on your perspective in terms of like where the Republican party is headed, where, where, like, it's just picking up. It, it feels like the, the ball has been rolling down the hill and it's just picking up momentum. Um, and there's been this shift, like you say, uh, at one point. And, and, and really 9-11, I think, interrupted it on some level, although, yep. you know, Bush did not have the, the uh, he did not win the popular vote uh, at all in 2000. Um, we know at one point they moved into sort of a minoritarian uh, sort of posture, like we're going to lead, even though we don't have as many people who want us to lead, uh, we're going to figure out ways of doing it. Voter suppression, um you know, gerrymandering, rely on the Senate, uh, Supreme Court, all those things, and maybe a little bit more. Where did it? Where does it go? Like, how far can you take that without it? And maybe the the real question is like, without the next step being laws that I mean, we see that in the context of like the Supreme Court doing this with with gerrymandering, right? Like, they're a couple of steps away from basically saying. Whoever controls the, the, the house, and literally there is no other principles associated with gerrymandering. Um, you, can't even, you can't even have an independent commission. Like the progression is they start to use the laws because they're running out of other sort of arrows in their quiver, right? That's exactly right. And if you look at the incentive structures on the right, they are all pushing in the same direction. They are towards strengthening these counter-majoritarian institutions, which we've seen over the past many years. Um, you know, when you see Republican state legislatures stripping governors of their power, and that's just how it how it goes, right? Um, and it has not cost Republicans too much power, right? They might lose a few elections here or there, but in the long term, not only have they been able to retain hold on power, but they have been able to retain control of these institutions. Um, and sometimes that breaks out into violence, um, like it did on January 6th. And the next step is to codify the aims of that violence into law. Um, so people freak out about it a little less, right? It's very easy to pay attention to a big spectacle event like January 6th and be concerned about it and be terrified by it. But we don't have that same level of terror when state houses are passing laws in order to seize control of the electoral votes in their state. Um, so I think that it is a that kind of cycle of violence turned to law 
of violence turned to law, all towards the end of retaining hold on power for the Republican Party, even at the cost of American democracy. And it is hard to see the Republican Party switching course um, because there are no incentives for them to switch course. I, I have tunnel vision about this, and I think our audience knows that, but it, it feels like, you know, when you talk about that cycle of violence and then uh, sort of like edify that with, with statue, it, it sounds like, you know, uh, things were happening in Reconstruction in, in, in many of those southern states where uh, there was this pushback to uh, black political power. Um, it, 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 it's a little bit, uh, it's a little disturbing. Hmm. But we, it, it's deeply <laughs> disturbing. <laughs> um, uh, with that said, uh, Nicole Hemmer, uh, it's a fascinating uh, a history and an important one for, for people to understand. Uh, professor of history at Vanderbilt University. The book is Partisans, the Conservative Revolutionaries Who Remade American Politics in the 1990s. We'll put a link to that at majority.fm. We'll put uh, a link in the podcast and YouTube descriptions. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having thank me. You.